you know, you got the people on social media that are just in your face all the time, right? They're just the trolls. And then you have this other group that's on the other extreme. It's like, can't we all be nice to each other? It's like, no. How about instead of being nice, we show kindness. Kind is hard because kind means that genuinely I care about you. I want to be kind to you. And that means being open to uncomfortable conversations. It means not always having to be right. That's a big one, right? Like just being truthful doesn't mean that you're always right. And that's why I don't like that, that term nice. So there's I that, there's that truth that you talk about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, I'm like, I kind of hate nice people. I'm like, come on, like, work on kindness, not nice. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential. And I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week, I share real, tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is a trained sociologist, an entrepreneur, and a certified strength, conditioning, and nutrition coach. This, of course, is what she does but it doesn't even come close to capturing who she is. That's better described as the outright seeker and bringer of the most brutal truth. Raised in a home where health, nutrition, even openness was in front and center, this writer, this speaker, and badass inspirer is able to speak with wisdom and clarity that most honestly can't match. And while it would be easy to assume she's always been this way, has always been this way, will always be this way, that's not the case. At the age of 10, she lost her father to suicide. And at the age of 27, she unfortunately had to bury her infant daughter. It was in this moment though, and the struggles that followed, where she gained a profound awareness of just how fleeting life really is. No longer able to waste another day, she left her job. She put work back into her marriage and she began to create the family and the life that now she knows she was meant to create. I can't wait to share with you the conversation I had with the creator and owner of EML, which means Eat, Move, Live, and Badass Inspirer, Evie Fats. You know, yeah. I've been told for my whole life that, you know, you're, you're too confident, which I'm not. You're, you're too direct. Um, you know, you don't hold back. And so I, I need people in my life who are willing to just be honest and say the truth. How did you... So, you know, you, you talk about truth, you talk about brutal truth, you know, your email is called weekly truth delivery. Um, uh, each episode of your podcast ends with the truth that you're currently experiencing. How did this come to be your thing? Oh, geez. Um, well, if we go back to the very, very beginning of time when I was um, just a kid, I grew up in a family where nobody really told the truth. <laughs> like no one's blatantly lying to one another, right? But there's a big difference between lying and then just not quite telling the truth. But we grew up in a scenario where you just, you had to walk delicately and always make sure that you never were hurting anybody's feelings. So that was kind of my whole entire environment when I was young. And honestly, at that time, I didn't think anything of it. Obviously, like that's just who I was and that's how my family was. Um, and the further I got in my life, I realized that the only thing that was doing, not just to myself, but even like family members and those people that I love and friends and, you know, coworkers was that constantly kind of trying to be soft and sugarcoat everything for people or always give them an out was really kind of doing that. It was giving them an out to not really be who they were born to be. 
I'm like, what a tragedy that is. If you think about it. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I I was just going to ask why, why was that in your, in your, you know, your family of origin, your upbringing, why was this like tiptoeing? Let's be super nice and not tell the truth. Why was that just a part of the family? Yeah, it was a little bit of our family dynamic. Um, I grew up with um, parents of five girls, and I'm the by a big leap. So they're like 14 years between me and the oldest, and then there's eight years between me and the next youngest. Um, and so we had a big family. My dad worked for my mom's family's construction company, which was built by my grandfather, just like from scratch. Um, and I don't ever really know why the, like why it would have come from my mom's side, but there was always a sense within my mom's family, like just make sure you're always doing the right thing. She's the oldest. She had a lot of pressure on her to always do what's right. Like we're an old Catholic family. It's like, like don't, don't in and kind of keep everything on the down low. And so, you know, I, I, it was well-intentioned. Believe me, it was, there was nothing malicious behind it. But people were always more concerned about what people thought about them than really what doing what made them happy. And, um, you know, tragically, that led to, you know, like my father commit suicide when I was 10 years old. So I experienced at a really young age the horrible catastrophic results of someone not being able to live to who they really are. So. And, and so you find yourself now in this position where, you know, truth is so important to you that, that you're not willing. It seems like you're unwilling to to live without the truth, the honesty, the direct talk. What, from, from kind of the childhood where we're where going back that that wasn't the case to where you are now, what, mm-hmm. what brought you to the point where you're willing to and courageous enough to be honest with people, even though it might cost a lot, and where you're not willing to let other people not be honest with you or, or bring the truth? What, you know, it, it, it might be something that comes naturally to you now, but I imagine it didn't always, right? Oh, no. <laughs> It definitely um, is kind of an ugly road. Um, I just found, like, I was married young. I've been married now for 24 years, and I'm 47 years old. So met my husband right before I graduated from high school. We dated for five years. So I was married at age 23, um, which now I look back, and that just, like, blows my mind. Um, but thankfully, I did find my best friend <laughs> when I was only <laughs> 23 years old. Um, but anyway, I, I was at a point in my life where I thought I wanted to go to law school. I put that on hold while my husband was in medical school because there was just no way that we were going to be able to financially juggle all of that. He was putting himself through medical school. So I had to work, worked in the legal field and decided that that really wasn't what I wanted to do. I loved history and, and had a sociology degree, but I didn't love the practice of law, which I found out early, which was good. So then I jumped around and I went into the financial field because I do have this ability to just make things happen, like through adversity, like dad dying at a young age, like I really kind of raised myself from that point on, I will get stuff done. So I was so buried in getting stuff done that I wasn't necessarily finding any kind of happiness or joy in what I was doing. Um, And that really led me to almost having um, like almost a shield up where I was like, I need to start being honest about who I really am. But I took it to an extreme. So I then became kind of a bully. (laughs) Are we there? Sorry, I got a delay on my end with you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I I don't know if it's my internet or if it's your internet, um, but but you cut off right when you said about about your degree. So oh, oh no problem. It's been, re- it's been recording the whole time. But I just didn't hear the answer. Okay, <laughs> I can back 
backtrack it. Um, so I was just realizing that in my professional life, I really wasn't happy. I was living kind of that falsity that I had been raised with. Like I'm married to a guy that's going to be a doctor. We're going to wait to have kids. We have two dogs. I'm earning money. I'm kind of quote unquote doing all the things that should make you happy, but I wasn't happy. And then at 27, um, we planned to have our first child. Um, I got pregnant very easily, like, because this is how everything supposedly should work out, right? You just want to have a baby and you try and you have one. Um, and midway through that pregnancy, I found out that, um, our daughter had, she was diagnosed with a most likely fatal chromosome abnormality. And it was one of those days where like I was someone like in one minute and then that news came and I was completely a different person that next second. And I think people that have had, you know, diagnosis of cancer or other, you know, tragic experiences in their life, they'll get what I'm saying. Like you're someone and then all of a sudden you're just someone else. Um, and so, you know, I delivered my daughter. She passed away the day she was born. Um, and it was really through the gift of her in even like her sh tiny short life. It was the biggest gift I ever got because I was like, life is so short and it's so fleeting and we go through it, you know, doing all the things that we're kind of pretending make us happy when we're not really happy. And from that day forward, I really did just refuse to live that way. I, leave, I refuse to just waste days kind of going through the motions or putting on an act or a show of what a happy life looks like. And I really had to spend some years figuring out like, what is it that I, that really makes me happy? <laughs> and, so, and, so and so it all started with me having to find my own truth. You know, you know the, sh the show's called We Do Hard Things because honestly, we, we grow the, the most during the hardest of times. Um, and there's, there's no one who gets through this life without facing hardship, without facing hard times or walking through really tough valleys. Um, you know, if, if you, if you can't name the hardest thing that you've done or had to experience, then you must be living a very sheltered life or you must be lying to yourself. And so, yeah. uh, you know, obviously when reviewing, you know, when reading your story and learning about you, um, one super inspired and drawn in by your strength and and what it is who it is you are today and who it is you're working at becoming i didn't even know about you know this this time um what 20 years ago now when you know you you write you know it's hard to describe the feeling of spending your first mother's day at the cemetery like i i'm the father of four children um i have friends who have lost children just like what a, a, a terrible thing what I'm interested or what I'm curious about is that may or may not have been the hardest point of your life because there's so much hardship. How did you get through it and stay sane, stay married? Um, how did you um, learn to have hope again? What did you learn from that deep, deep sorrow? Um those are really great questions because those are all things that just like could could bury someone right? all of those things grieving with a spouse and you grieve separately but you have to grieve together and um so <laughs> quite honestly i wasn't sane for a while <laughs> let's just put that out there i was not sane <laughs> um i spent my first mother's day at the cemetery like you said and I would literally go to the cemetery in the mornings and this is going to just sound so crazy, but I'm going to say it that I literally like wanted to dig my daughter up. Mm. <laughs> I, that is like the rawest way I can explain pain. Like I truly wanted her so bad that I wanted to dig her out of the ground. Like, I mean, we, I almost laugh about it now. Right? It doesn't sound anything to laugh about, but all these years later, when you really embrace like human experience and human emotions, that's about as raw as it gets. So I was not sane for quite a while. Um, I did have a really awesome support 
from my family. And I'm, even though I'm the youngest, I'm kind of like the leader in my family. And so watching me struggle and how I was embracing that struggle instead of trying to push it away, I didn't medicate, right? I wanted to feel all of that. Um, that kind of helped my family. I was almost like the leader in the grief process and I helped my family learn how to support me and kind of almost be more honest about accepting pain in their life. A pain that like a lot of us never dealt with even when my dad died, right? Like we almost all got to go through some of that experience together and heal together through the death of my daughter. So that was a big part of it. Um, a big part of it is my faith. So I'm a strong believer in God. I'm not necessarily a religious person, but I have a very strong faith in spirituality and I do believe in God. And um, I do have to share this story with you because it's kind of powerful. I had, I'm, I have an art degree as well. So I had painted um, dragonflies all over my daughter's walls when I was preparing for her before we knew that she was sick. So her room was full of, it was a dragonfly thing. Well, the day, the first day my husband had to go back to work and leave me at home alone after she passed away. He, I walked him to the door and I didn't want him to leave because I was afraid to be alone. Um, and when we opened the door and he gave me a hug and there was a dragonfly that was sitting on the light outside of our front door. And Mark, I'm like, you can't make this up. When he came home that night, like, I mean, he was a resident at that time. So we're talking like 14 hours later, that dragonfly was still sitting on that lamp. And I had those kind of experiences. I know that probably sounds so far out there, but like, it just was like, it gives me chills to this very day when I first started to run again. Cause I was like, I need my physical body to feel good in order for my mind to feel good. Like a dragonfly would run next to me. Like it would be flying next to me as I was running it. Like, and I had a garden and those dragonflies were always all over the garden. So there was a spiritual element where I had a sense of peace spiritually even though I was suffering. Do you... And then my husband and I, oh, go ahead. No, no, please, please continue. Um, my husband and I grieved very differently. And for some reason, and I think it's a grace from God that we just allowed ourselves to do that. So I tried not to make him grieve the way I was grieving. Right? Like digging in the dirt and building a garden and all this is what healed me. And he was like, I got to bury myself in work and I got to try to like accomplish things in my life because I can't face this. Right. So we grieved separately, but then eventually we came together by allowing ourselves that separate grief. So I think most people that those things split up, it's a lot of because we want other people to, to grieve the exact same we do. And we can't, like we can't expect that from one another. Nobody grieves the same. So those took, you know, several years. That was like a three-year process of really kind of getting policy in our life. You know, when, when I, I have four kids and so um, our oldest is 13, our youngest is six. And oh, wow. I, what I've realized in the last few years is I have such a scarcity mindset that, you know, my wife and I, when we had our first, we were just praying and we were so thankful that she was healthy. And then we had our second. And um, during one of the scans, our son had, um, had something on, on his brain and it kind of worried us. And a few weeks later, it went away. And we're like, oh, fantastic. And then we had our third and we're just like waiting for something to go wrong. You know, we're just, we, we've already had two healthy kids, you know, like what's the chances we're going to have a third that's healthy and he's perfectly healthy. So by the time we're having our fourth, we are just anxious we're waiting for something to go wrong we're waiting for the shoe to drop and then she's healthy so then i go well if the kids are going to get hurt as they grow up right and then the kids don't hurt get hurt as they grow up and and so every you know up until maybe a year or two ago every year that would go on i'd go like we're just too lucky like like we're gonna run out of luck eventually and something terrible is gonna happen and go wrong i'm just waiting for it to happen I think if I had experienced, you know, like I, I carry that fear still. I think if I'd experienced such a traumatic loss, um, 
I guess I've seen it go two ways. I have friends who have lost a, a child at the age of two and it, it, I think it crushed them. Mm-hmm. It seems like you lost a, a, a baby and yet it spurred in you the like, okay, I'm off to the next thing. I, there, there's purpose, there's drive, there's desire. I'm going to do more with it. Um, how do you not let, is, is it that the, you've already faced the hardest thing that you think you may ever face? And so everything else is a little easier or is it like, I got through that. I can get through whatever's next. Or is it just like, you don't have any other choice? Honestly, it became for me a matter of honoring her life. Like, the minute she was born and holding her and looking at her and seeing just how precious her tiny little soul was. And she looked just like my husband with all this dark hair. Um, it felt like I would be dishonoring her if I didn't make the most of my life and try to help other people make the most of their life because she didn't even get one. Like I planned her funeral long before she was born because I was like, I'm never going to do the first birthday party. I'm never going to do kindergarten, right? I'm never going to see her get married. Like I wanted to make her life count. And I felt like the way I could do that was by living my own life to the fullest. And then I eventually figured out that meant professionally me taking it to the next step and helping other people live their life to the fullest. Okay. So, so, so this is, this is interesting. You know, I saw that you wrote truth. You know, I I love that you start your posts with truth. What you choose to do today will either take you closer to your goals or further away. Now that was on a post showing you on stage speaking at a, at an event. How did you get connected with Ed Milet? Oh, I just went out there on a limb, right? Like I, um, I don't have a problem seeking out people that I want to be integral players in my life. And so, cause what's the worst they're going to tell me is like, for one, they won't answer. <laughs> right. It's like, Oh, okay. No big deal. Or they can say, I just time or an interest in that. Um, and I've had a track record of doing that now in recent years, there's a breach there where I was kind of a hot mess still, but now I've gotten to the point where I don't mind just asking for people to be in my life that I need in my life. And so I applied to the Arte syndicate and they don't accept very many people. I needed a mentor. I was at a point where I'd stopped competing in fitness in CrossFit, sold my gym, moved. I had all these life changes and I was like, I'm building a really big enterprise now. And I was like, I need business mentors that are going to be able to help me lead the way. Um, And so I reached out and out of like 33,000 applicants, I got one of the 60 spots. (laughs) <laughs> why, why do you think that is? Um, I think it's because of my ability to be completely honest. And people are kind of tired right now of seeing kind of the social media front of everybody's lives. And my ability to just say, like, I'm really imperfect. I'm struggling. I need help. I have a lot of really good gifts and really good talents, but I don't know how to always put them to work. And for someone that is like such a high achiever like Ed, like obviously that's appealing, right? You know, I know that your whole thing is about truth and obviously you're telling the truth. Do you think we spend a lot of time lying to ourselves? Oh, a tremendous amount. And this would be a good place for me to point out that, you know, between the death of my daughter and then I had two subsequent miscarriages that led me to just go, you know, this is probably not my path. And I adopted my daughter from China. And so from that stage to like where I am and probably in the last, you know, five, seven years of my life, um, I took that truth to the extreme. I didn't quite know how, how to use it. And I had a lot of strength within myself, but I spent many years being like, and that's actually almost constantly pointing out everything else that everybody else needs to do and their so-called truth, but not really willing to face your own. And so I use that strength as almost like a front to keep people away. Mm. Um, and then like lots of years, you know, 10 years of coaching and I'm a constant learner. I started to be willing to kind of let my own guard down and realize that being, being empowered doesn't mean being a bully. 
And I think in any more people are lying to themselves and they're almost using now saying like, well, I just tell the truth and they're really not telling the truth. They're just kind of being obnoxious, <laughs> right? Like over sharing, sharing just weird stuff. Nobody really cares about being bossy almost so that nobody will question you. I, I, so I, I don't know. I know that we have a, we both know Evan Carmichael. Um, you know, we've been friends yeah. for maybe 13 years and um, I wrote a post a very long time ago because for some reason I got into a debate with someone on Facebook about uh, Aboriginal communities. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Why what. not? <laughs> and I was just, I'm, I'm a very like um, devil's advocate kind of person. And so mm -hmm. I will point out the other side of something just for the sake, and it gets me into trouble all the time, just for the sake of pointing out the other side. I can see both sides. I'm, I don't have a camp. I'm just going to say, if you're left, I'm going to say, well, what about the people who think right? And this person just blasted me. And I said, hey, like, you know, you, I, I don't have a pony in this race, right? Like, like I'm just pointing out someone else's perspective, um, you know, calm down. And then they were like, I don't care. I would tell this to your face. I would say this because it has to be said. And they just went on and on about the, their truth and their truth and their truth. And I was like, you know what? Being truthful doesn't give you the right to be rude. I mean, like there's, there's a difference between, between like, I'm going to hit you with the truth. And it's like coming from a place of compassion or caring about the person or saying what the person doesn't, maybe doesn't want to hear, but needs to hear, which is, right. I know thing. And just being like, I'm going to just talk and you better listen. I feel like a very honest and transparent person, but I know I'm not truthful with myself. I know that I'm not truthful with others. I know that I hedge all the time. What would you say to someone like me, maybe who just wants to be a nice person? You know, like I want people to like me. I want to be a nice person. Um, uh, you know, the lies I tell myself, the half truths that I tell others to be nice. How, how can I be more bold and direct without hurting others? What lessons have you learned going from being a bully to being the coach that you are now? Um, I'm so glad that you use that word nice um, because I hate it. <laughs> 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 because nice is just, what is nice, right? Nice is like, come on. Like, I don't like nice people because I know they're really not showing anything authentic about themselves. If I'm so worried about being so nice to everybody, like you, know, you got the people on social media that are just in your face all the time, right? They're just the trolls. And then you have this other group that's on the other extreme. It's like, can't we all be nice to each other? It's like, no, how about instead of being nice, we show kindness. Mm -hmm. Kind is hard. Because kind means that genuinely, I care about you. I want to be kind to you. And that means being open to uncomfortable conversations. It means not always having to be right. That's a big one, right? Like just being truthful doesn't mean that you're always right. And that's why I don't like that, that term nice. So I there's encourage that, There's that truth that you talk about, right? <laughs> Yeah, I got to tell you, I'm like, I kind of hate nice people. I'm like, come on, <laughs> like work on kindness, not nice. Plus on the serious side of that, kindness really comes from a genuine place within you. And niceness comes from what you worry about other people thinking about you. And so when you keep that kindness in mind, that's the difference between being a bully. See, that's so clear. Right? If I'm genuinely caring about you, I'm not going to bully you. If I'm genuine, I'm not just going to be nice to you and tell you everything you want to hear. If I'm truly kind, I have your best interests at heart and I'm willing to make myself uncomfortable in order to help you. So you, you mentioned that you're an achiever. W would, you, would you say that you're an achiever? Oh, overachiever. It's okay. So, so you're an it's over. My gift and my so, so the gift and your greatest weakness is your ability to see something, to attack something, to want to make it happen, to being competitive, and all of, you know, all of those things for the gold star, for the inner pride, or whatever it is. Um, yep. So, were you always someone 
you know, I get the sense that you're someone who, who attacks things. My, uh, my attack time on things is terrible and I don't want it to be terrible. You know, like, like I will come up with an idea and then I'll think about the idea and I'll get excited about the idea. Then I'll talk myself out of the idea or this or that. Um, I let myself off the hook and, you know, like I'm someone who has never been athletic, who has been overweight almost my entire life. And then oh, two that. years ago, I started finally, uh, I, I've lost 50 pounds. Um, I've taught myself that, yes, I can run. And um, yes, I can be attractive. And yes, I can get fit. Um, but every step along the way, it's been like, I've, I've lost weight despite like, I, I didn't think I could lose weight. And then I get on the scale. I'm like, oh, look, I lost weight. Um, I didn't think that I could uh, s- start lifting weights very, very, like, I'm, I'm not into lifting yet, but start lifting weights. And then I find myself a friend saying, hey, come lift weights. And I'm like, oh, I'm scared. And he goes, no, come. And then I'm suddenly I'm lifting weights. And so, like, I, I succeed despite myself. You seem like the type of person who succeeds because you apply yourself. How can I get better at attack time? How can I get better at determination? How can I get better at, at all of the things like you lift? I think everyone who lifts must know that they lift despite the fact it's painful. They lift despite the fact that they hate it. They lift despite the fact that, that it doesn't feel good. I don't do it because it's intimidating. It's scary. It doesn't feel good. I don't think I can do it. All of those things, but I want to beat that. Um, I think there's kind of two parts to that answer. For one, I do think that it's somewhat ingrained in me to crave a level of discomfort. Like when I was little, I was the girl in the neighborhood that would, you know, like I would go send flyers out to everybody in the neighborhood and put on a play where I was like, you know, doing the Wizard of Oz play and rolling up the garage door. And I like was going to be front and center. And most people that would make them devastated, right? Like, no, I like that kind of, that lit me up. So I have a little bit of a craving to be uncomfortable. And then I think like through the experiences of death, like you know, with my dad and then my daughter, and I, I experienced so much growth through discomfort that I got used to practicing being uncomfortable. Mm. So it's a little bit in some of us more than others. I would say that that's probably true. But I also think that that's not always there because there's a lot of stuff I do, like even coming on this show today, it's like, I'm scared to do that, right? You'd never know that, but I am. Because like every time I set my own camera for my own podcast in my own room where no one's in here, right? Like you just delete it if it goes wrong. I'm still nervous to do those things. But I've gotten really good at not stopping because it's uncomfortable. And that was a big part of like, I was really, really at all. Um, but the more I got CrossFit and when I owned my gym and then started competing, like people would ask me like, why would you do this? Cause that stuff is really painful. If you've ever done a CrossFit workout and then do it for three days straight, <laughs> right? For eight hours, it's horrible. But I grew so much as a person and it made me so much more brave when I like empowered my body and then it helped me empower my mind. The more, the stronger I got physically, the stronger I got mentally, where then I didn't shy away from having honest conversations with people. And then that allowed me to like develop relationships further with them because I was willing to have uncomfortable conversations. So I think the, the, the hardest thing for me as an observer in our society right now is that everybody wants everything to be really easy and when we want everything to be easy it's not going to be fulfilling it's just not we've gotten really comfortable our groceries get delivered to us if there's if there's really we don't have to do anything that we don't want to do but you're never really going to live to your fullest potential if you do that you've got to realize like life is uncomfortable and all the good really good stuff is kind of gritty and then it makes you so proud of yourself once you've done it so the, the reason why Evan's like, you need to speak to Evie is because I, I know the word grit has become like this adjective that people love, right? You know? Yeah. But um, I, I, I don't think that, you know, I don't think that I'm gritty enough. I don't think that I'm hard enough. Um, I grew up, um, I grew up like honestly being like a pretty smart guy who's a really quick learner who has a great memory. I don't mind speaking to people. I don't mind connecting with people. And earlier this week, I was thinking about this. Like, I honestly feel like I haven't failed enough at life. 
I just, it's just things have gone well. And so I'm kind of like good, but, but deep down inside, I want to be like extraordinary. I don't, I don't want to be good. I want to be extraordinary. And so, uh, you know, in the last losing this weight was like, oh, okay, so I can lose weight. And, you know, um, I, I work out at orange theory fitness. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them or not, but, but I like the workout structure. And then during this whole COVID thing, I was like, I guess I'm just going to run. So now like, you know, I run, um, a 10 K most days, sometimes it's 10 K then 5 K or whatnot. But, um, yeah, like I'm learning to challenge myself and say, can I do that? Last night we opened our pool. It was only 16 degrees. And I said to the kids, I'm like, I'm jumping in the pool. And so I'm like, it's not going to kill me. I'm jumping in the pool. Uh, is, is that, is that really just the secret to this is just challenging yourself to do harder and harder things. I know you coach a ton of people. So how do you break through whatever that mindset challenge or that disbelief is? And then how do you prove to yourself that you can do it and then not give up when it gets hard? Well, I think the secret to that is that you can't take on too much too soon. So I am kind of the anti-fitness fitness person. I don't believe that 99% of what's taught out there in fitness is effective. I really don't because I think it goes against our human nature. Our human nature, we're, we're hardwired to want safety and security, consistency. And when you try to get someone to change their whole life up, like upside down in a day through some you know 30 day program, it doesn't work. It works for 30 days or however long they're gonna do it, but it sets them up for failure. And the proof's in the numbers, right? I mean, look at obesity rates, depression, suicide rates, like it's just not working. I do the exact opposite. I teach people to take on one thing. But then that one thing, like I'm relentless with them on it. Like there's no off day. There, like it has to be one thing that's outside your comfort zone that you're not messing around. Like we're taking, we're, I'm only asking you to do one thing, not 20. Everybody can do one thing. And it has to be something that is very challenging for them and makes them uncomfortable. Because being uncomfortable takes practice, right? Like think about like the first time I ever spoke on a stage or anything. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. And then the more you do it, you're still nervous, but that nerve like kind of turns into adrenaline and it becomes a positive thing. That's true in all the little things. So I think, I think what people need to focus on is don't discount all the small things. Don't, if you're, you know, a hundred pounds overweight, don't discount taking the stairs, right? Cause that's a hard thing for you when you're carrying a hundred extra pounds, yeah. but people kind of gloss over all the small things and they want there to be some big magical, big hard thing that they're going to do and conquer and their life's going to be different. It doesn't happen that way. It happens from all the tiny steps of always choosing what's more difficult. And so, so I think that there's a ton of focus these days on uh, the thing that will get people started that sees the best outcome at the end. So it used to be the, th you know, maybe it still is in the industry, right? The 30 day diet, the, the, the new year's transformation, the, you know, like just do the abs, but, but, you know, people talk about the fact that if you just walk 15 minutes a day and do it every single day, you'll, you'll see some improvement, which will give you some confidence and then that confidence will lead probably to you drinking more water or, or yeah. whatever. Like, it's just like, it eases people in. I've, I've been yeah. eased in. So now I'm ready for like advanced level courses or whatnot. So <laughs> surely the answer isn't just more of the same, right? Like, like I, I, I was, um, you know, I, I was someone who were, it kind of things came easy to me and I didn't really push myself very hard. I'm now want to be more like David Goggins, but I, I, I worry that I'm not disciplined enough, that I'm really not competitive enough, that I don't have the attack time that I need. What do you say for the more advanced people, the harder people, the people like you, you know, like, like, like you're not, you're not letting yourself have free passes all the time and still achieving what you're achieving. I do let myself off the hook sometimes, right? Because I'm just human. <laughs> and then, but I've gotten enough discipline now where, I, I'm able to kind of kick myself in gear and there's been stages where I can't. And so then I seek help from other people. Right? Um, I just hired a performance coach, not an athletic performance coach, but just a life and my business performance coach, because I've been in kind of like a 
I'm not happy with where I'm at. I'm like, I feel myself slipping. So I do slip too. Um, this is something that's super powerful. I, I heard it on, it was in an Arate summit that I was just on, um, that you're missing connection with, or clarity with the long-term outcome. And I found myself doing that. So the choices that we make on a daily basis have to be somehow very clear, connected to what we're trying to accomplish. And that really kind of sounds so basic, but it really kind of blew my mind because I'm really creative. I kind of tackle things, but then I let my foot off the gas all the time. So I like, we wouldn't even have time in a three hour show for me to tell you all the businesses that I've created and the stuff that I have behind the scenes that we've never even because that's my downfall. Like I get out or something, but then I don't have enough clarity in connection to the long term. So that's powerful, right? Instead of just getting up and, you know, running for the day, that's awesome. But you're there now. Like that's kind of become pretty comfortable for you. Right? So you have to look at how do I clarify and connect to what I want two years from now, five years from now, who is that person? And then you do the small work on the daily basis to connect to that long term clear, clear goal. And that's where I'm still struggling. Like I, there's areas in my life where I don't really know what that long-term goal is. Like I'm creating and I'm doing, but then it can just become kind of grinding. Right. And for no real purpose. Well, so if I can share, I mean, you know, the reason why I was able to finally at the age of 35, I'm 37 now start to get healthy. Um, you know, I, I, I was sitting, getting my hair cut. I, up until a few weeks ago, I had hair. <laughs> I was sitting getting my hair cut and I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And I used to wear glasses before I got laser eye surgery. And so the thing with wearing glasses is you never have to really look at yourself, right? You know, you go get your hair cut, you take your, your glasses off. You can't, I couldn't see anything. You know, you go to get in the shower, you take your glasses off. You really can't see anything. You never really have to look at yourself. And I got laser eye surgery and I was sitting there staring at myself in the mirror. And I was like, you know, 50 pounds heavier. So is in the high two thirties. Um, and I'm only five, nine. And so, you know, I'm, I'm like, Oh, I don't look good. And then we take the kids to Florida and I'm looking at the pictures and, you know, it's like, I'm going from one size shirt to another size shirt. That was my secret, right? You don't have to lose weight if you just buy bigger shirts. <laughs> and so, and so finally I'm like, I got to do something about this. And we started, I started, I think I lost maybe 20 pounds, but it really kicked in when, you know, I went to Tony Robbins and I thought about, I thought about all of the stuff that I'm dealing with and going through and my limiting self-beliefs. And, and finally I, I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? You know, my grandfather died at 32 of a heart attack and my dad was always afraid of dying. Oh and I thought, well, what if I'm not, what if I don't live into my seventies? And I thought, well, that's not painful enough. What if, you know, I don't, um, you know, what if I don't, what if I die in my fifties? And I'm like, well, that's not painful enough. And I was like, what if I will never meet my grandkids? You know, what if, what if I die before I can ever meet my grandkids? And it was like, that was enough to get me, you know, like if, if I'm, if I don't feel like running, I just imagine how hard I have to work to meet, you know, my granddaughter or grandson and being handed to me and all this stuff. And let me tell you that worked to a point Right. And now it's like, well, now I'm pretty healthy. Now I'm going to meet them. And so the next thing becomes like fear. Like I'm afraid I'm going to go back. I can't go back. I don't want to go back. I'm afraid I'm going to go back, but that still just keeps me where I am. So when you, when you, you have these whys in your life or in your coaching or in your business or in fitness or whatever it is, when you have these whys and they're painful enough, they will get you started. Then fear of going back might keep you where you are. But is it, is, is the answer just harder and more like it, the progression is typically the answer, right? So is it just like, for me, just put in more hours, just run faster, just run harder, just lift heavier. You know, my diet's already pretty crazy. I, I don't know how much more I can do on that side. Like, is it just more, more is always the answer. I can tell you for me, I take what you were saying about facing your mortality and like, what if you didn't get to see your grandkids? I take that 
into my everyday life. And it's not to say that I focus on dying. That is not it at all. Because everybody's like, that's depressing. Who wants to think about dying every day? But I have a practice at the end of every day. I ask, like, if this was it and I don't get to see tomorrow's sunrise, would I be content with who I am and what I gave to the world? And did I leave everybody a little bit better than they were the day before? And so it's not necessarily focusing on death every day, but it's focusing on the reality of, I really don't know when the end of my days are, right? None of us really do. Most people would probably tell you, yeah, they live every day like this could be it. So I really do live every single day like this could be it. And I wake up in the morning. I have a practice in the morning. It's like, what do I, what is my day going to look like? And at the end of the day, I ask myself two questions, like, where did I drop the ball? Because I'm not criticizing myself, but like, there's always areas that I've, I've done things that are less than optimal or were less than my best. So where did I drop the ball? And then what did I really nail that day? Repeat, repeat, repeat that same process every single day. And that's just training my brain. So then all the little things, the fear and all those things that want to hold you back or I'm not enough, right? I'm not smart enough or everything comes easy to me, right? Those become less and less, not because you're trying to push them out, but they automatically just kind of go away. The the, I don't have it, right? I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I couldn't do that. I don't have it that that's that's the thing that that's my biggest challenge my biggest challenge is i just don't think i'm good enough um or if i make a mistake that i should have known somehow or i should have done things differently and um i don't know that's something i got to work on or, or maybe for the rest of my life i don't know yeah it always is the rest of our life right like there's no like i don't believe that there's just work and then all of a sudden you reach some kind of pinnacle you may in your career or something, but your life is never just some kind of finish line. You're not finished until you're in the ground, right? <laughs> like, and I think that keeping that at the forefront of your mind is really powerful as well, right? Like there is no done. So instead of just like, I have to run longer, I have to do all these elevated levels of fitness. Well, maybe not, right? You're not done, but you just continue to challenge yourself in different areas with a purpose, not just for the sake of doing something harder that everybody just thinks harder is better, right? Like I hate that in fitness. Like I did CrossFit, but I wouldn't recommend it for most people. Like if you, I have had a shoulder, total shoulder repair two years ago that destroyed my, my mindset. Like it set me back huge. Like that was something I didn't envision. And I, you know, that was the cost of admission for doing the fitness I did. But I wouldn't recommend that to everyday people that just want to get fit. Why do you want to do that? You don't want to destroy your body, right? So people that just do more for the sake of doing more, they have to ask themselves again, attach that clarity to five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. If you're doing box jumps every day or pounding your knees, like what does that look for you look like for you when you're 65 and you want to go travel with your grandkids and do you have a knee replacement then? So I'm not a big fan of just make it harder for the sake of it being hard. I actually just kind of think that's almost low level thinking. So then, okay. So hard with a purpose and then the outcome. Uh, yeah, that's it. I, I think everyone's too soft on themselves. They're too nice on themselves. And so what I'm at the point right now, and I may not be in a few years, but I'm at the point right now where I need, I need, I need to remind myself that I'm too soft and need to go harder and harder. My wife worries for me. You know, my wife's a physical trainer, a personal trainer, and she's, um, she's worried that I'm just going to find myself pushing myself too far, too hard, what have you. And I think that there's great takeaway, especially mentally from pushing yourself physically. Like, I don't think you can actually ultimately be where you need to be like spiritually and mentally without pushing your body as well. Right? Like, I think all three of those are intertwined. You don't just get to do one without the other. Um, so I do think that there is huge, huge gifts to get from doing physically challenging things. But I also just think you have to always weigh like what is the long-term repercussions of those things and is it worth it? Wasn't that something? 
Evie's story can help us tackle our own hard things in life. Key takeaways for me. Number one, instead of being nice, show kindness. And kindness is hard because it shows you care and you aren't afraid to have the genuinely difficult conversations. Number two, life is uncomfortable. and All the really good stuff in life is gritty. It makes us proud when we tackle the good and hard things in life. And number three, there is no finish line. You're not finished until you are in the ground. So keep doing the hard things and follow that purpose. But of course, this only helps if you actually put these tips into practice. I just want to remind you though, that you can rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It would mean so much to me if you did that. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe already. And lastly, if you want to connect with me directly, follow me on IG and send me a DM. I check everything myself and I love to respond. Remember, those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But to do so, you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. Why? Because you, me, all of us, we do hard things.